lots of uh, association and nice Krishna Prashad. So, festivity is a part of spiritual life. And this festivity actually makes Krishna consciousness so joyful. Srila Prabhupada used to say that in spiritual sky every day there is a festival. Uh, they're constantly enjoying. And that is what everybody wants, joy. Everybody wants to be joyful. So, uh, anandam and spiritual world is anandam buddhi bardhanam pratipadam purnam rita swadhanam. That experience that joy, so much joy that one literally becomes submerged in an ocean of joy. Ananda Ambuti. And that ocean of ecstasy keeps on increasing. So more and more ecstatic. And it's an endless experience of ecstasy. From the material platform we cannot even understand what it is like. Because uh, material nature is khandita, separated and it is divided. And everything has its limit. Uh, one can enjoy and enjoy, but then it comes to a point he cannot enjoy anymore. He reaches the optimum point. Mm. Or uh, happiness, there is some point, there is distress. Happiness turns into misery. Mm. Even food, we may not, no matter how much we like that food, but you know, after eating something, after eating, to some extent, we can't eat anymore. Uh, so this is how the this is the criteria for the material nature. Uh, everything comes to an ending point, but there is. Uh, no such ending points in the spiritual world. It's never ending. It keeps on increasing. At least mm, being in situations where we get the reflection, we get the taste, we get the glimpse of the spiritual sky, we somehow get to see how it is possible. There is, it is possible to be in a situation when there is, the joy is endless. And why is that problem? And uh, like that also we can very easily consider uh, that the material existence is actually uh, we spiritual beings functioning through the body made of matter. So whatever we do, we are actually uh, trying to do that through this body. Uh, and that is why through this body, first of all, it's an endeavor for the spirit soul to activate the body to become spiritualized. Uh, life means spiritualization of matter. Due to the presence of the spirit soul, the body made of matter is spiritualized. So it is matter is non-spiritual and we are trying to spiritualize the matter. Therefore it's a big endeavor. And therefore, at some point, uh, we cannot do it anymore. And that's when it's come to an end. Mm. This body, the soul tries to activate the body. Mm. But then at some point, the soul says, well, I can't do it anymore. Mm. And that is the time uh, the soul gives up. And that's the time we fall asleep. 
that is why sleep is so necessary sleep is actually the rejuvenation of the soul the soul is functioning through the body but at some point the soul cannot continue anymore so it just uh, gives up and sleep also has two states dream state and dreamless state the real sleep is dim dreamless state and at that state the soul goes close to krishna close to the supreme personality of god in and that is how it gets rejuvenated and sleep state a dream state is the state when the gross body is inactive but the subtle body is still active that is the state of dream the subtle body is still active so <clears throat> now we can see that mm, we have three states of existence gross subtle spiritual and we have this wakeful state in the wakeful state uh, the both the gross body and the subtle body are active dream state the gross body is inactive subtle body is active and then when we go beyond the gross material platform subtle material platform then we come to the spiritual platform then the question may arise then why don't we reach that state uh, in the dream in the dreamless state of state of deep sleep yeah it's true in deep sleep state we are away from gross body gross plane we are away from the subtle plane we are very close to the spiritual plane but our consciousness is still projected towards the material nature that's why the moment we wake up we wake up in this region if we could somehow wake up in that region then we would find then we would find ourselves in a spiritual world but in for, in order to do that we have to turn our consciousness towards that direction and that's where krishna consciousness is necessary become krishna conscious uh, become situated in the spiritual platform yeah one point i was trying to make here was it is difficult to activate the gross body mm. because a gross it's so we have to soul has to activate it make it conscious it's difficult but to be active on the subtle plane is easier that's how we can see like to move from here to say 100 meters the gross body takes so much effort right but for the subtle body in a flash of a moment it can move from here to uh, united states of america in a fraction of a moment the body just subtle body moved from uh, so this is how subtle the subtle body is so if the subtle body is so subtle then what to speak of the spiritual body therefore when you become situated in a spiritual platform spiritual identity uh, then everything becomes so easy uh, because there is no need to mo- to move anything no need to spiritualize anything it's already spiritual then the spiritual world is full of movement but the difference is in the spiritual world everything is centered around krishna whereas in the material world everything is centered around our material identity everything is centered around me and what's the difference between me wrong me and right me false ego and real identity what's the difference the false one 
is centered around the body and the real real one real identity is centered around krishna jiver swarup hoy krishner nitya das so that is our real identity and our business is to become situated in our real identity so that's why uh, we are here that's why we are doing whatever we are doing and what we are actually doing is to lead a life centered around krishna we get up in the morning what why do we get up so early in the morning because we have to go and see krishna in the temple mangalaratik because we have to chant krishna's holy name because we have to uh, lead a life with krishna in the center we have to create krishna consciousness we have to we have to uh, involve our consciousness from completely centered around krishna therefore ultimately only there is two options either away from krishna or towards krishna that's about the only consideration uh, when it is towards krishna we are rightly situated when it is away from krishna we are wrongly situated when it is towards krishna then we are uh, then we are situated on the spiritual plane when we are looking away from krishna we are in the material platform so <clears throat> ultimately the only consideration for krishna consciousness is to be uh, centered around krishna this morning i briefly mentioned about um, puran and upanishad and uh, upanishad is philosophy and the essence of all upanishads is bhagavad gita whereas uh, in the puran section the essence of all purans is shrimad bhagavatam purans are stories not really stories when we use the expression story then it implies that it is fictitious it is it is uh, imaginary it's not real actually the ex- real expression for that is fiction fiction the stories are fiction fictitious fictional whereas uh, the puranas are not vedic scriptures has no room for lies it's all truth and nothing but the truth so <clears throat> pur there is the puranas and also i mentioned that i at some point i turned my seminars more into stories because i saw that philosophy generally tends to make one fall asleep uh, whereas stories i noticed they wake up everybody wakes up therefore i thought that okay i'll just tell stories and the first story of that nature first real story happening that i selected was ramayan then mahabharat uh, and it had been going on like that for last few years and so this year i decided to tell the stories of shrimad bhagavatam you will notice uh, the difference between bhagavad gita and bhagavatam in that respect bhagavad gita is dealing with just uh, that's 
philosophy, facts. Nainang chindanti shastrani, the soul, the body cannot cut the soul. I mean, the body cannot be cut by any weapon. I'm sorry, the soul cannot be cut by any weapon. Soul cannot be burned by fire. The soul is never born, and so and so forth. Uh, the soul's relationship with Krishna, uh, and uh, how Krishna uh, takes care of us. Do you come across any story in Bhagavad Gita? No. Bhagavad Gita is a part of a big story. <laughs> that is Mahabharat. Uh, whereas in Srimad Bhagavatam, you'll notice it's all one after another stories. How is the story beginning? Huh? The story is beginning in a forest called Naimi Sharanya. Uh, Naimi Sharanya. And in Naimi Sharanya, all the 60,000 sages assembled, seeing the precarious, dangerous situation of the age of Kali. Kali Yuga just began. Kali Yuga just began and at that time all these personalities assembled there to consider uh, how to rectify this dangerous situation of the age of Kali. Now this is one uh, characteristic of a saintly personality. A saintly personality always wishes others' welfare. A saintly personality is always concerned about others' welfare. Uh, he is not so much concerned about his own welfare. Uh, because, uh, there is also a because in that. A saintly personality is not concerned about his welfare because he knows that Krishna will take care of him. He has taken, he has surrendered himself to Krishna and Krishna will take care of him. Therefore he is not concerned about his welfare. But he is concerned about others' welfare. And what does he do for that? For the sake of others' welfare? Now that he found the actual welfare activity, the actual situation to become perfectly situated in a state of happiness or joy is to take shelter of Krishna. You take shelter of Krishna and Krishna will take care of you in all respects. Uh, that, is the, uh, that is the understanding of a saintly personality. And that's why he doesn't care for his own welfare because he knows that it has already been taken care of. And since he knows that the way, what is the way to actually create the real welfare, uh, that is uh, to come to the shelter of Krishna. So his business is to bring everyone to Krishna. So why the sages in Naimi Sharana became so concerned about the situation of the age of Kali? Because they saw that people are totally averse to Krishna consciousness. Therefore they are uh, thinking that how to bring them into that platform of Krishna consciousness. How to bring them into Krishna consciousness. Because then they are naturally so averse to it. So that's why uh, they decided to perform a sacrifice. Not just an ordinary sacrifice. Sahasra Samamasata. A thousand year long sacrifice. That's what they decided to perform. So they 60,000 of these sages assembled in Naimi Sharanya to perform a thousand year long sacrifice. And in that assembly, they selected Sutta Goswami to be the speaker. Why? Because they consider that Sutta Goswami is the most qualified to perform this uh, 
to, to take the lead. Uh, and they also addressed him, like uh, expressing his qualification. Taya khalu puranani sheti hashani chanagha akhatanna paditani dharma shastrani jannuta taya khalu puranani cheti hashani chanagha first of all his what is his qualification anagha sinless you are sinless and uh, you have understood the Puranas, Puranani, Itihashani, History, uh, Dharma Shastra, Samhitas, and uh, other such scriptures. Mm. That's why, please tell us what should be done. Taya khalu puranani sheti hashani chanagha akhatanna paditani dharma shastrani jannata. So the person, uh, the speaker needs a specific qualification. And the qualification is that he is expert in all these scriptures. He is completely conversant with these Vedic scriptures. Uh, and on top of that, uh, he has to be sinless. And then Sutta Goswami started to tell them about the essence of the Vedic wisdom. Yeah, why the essence was necessary here? Because previously one had to master the subject completely uh, after thorough studying, careful studying. They used to spend their entire life. First of all, their life was, the lifespan was very long. They were extremely intelligent. They were practically shutidhar. Uh, just by here they could remember it. So that is how uh, qualified they were in the other ages. Therefore they could study the Vedas and understand it completely. Even they, can, they could go step by step. Uh, like from Karmakanda section to Gyanakanda section to ultimate uh, point of Bhakti. Uh, that is the ultimate. Uh, Karmakanda, Gyanakanda, then uh, Bhakti, which begins with surrender, Prapatti or Sharanagati. But <clears throat> in the age of Kali, the situation will be very different. Uh, they consider that. Uh, that the duration of the life of the living entities in the age of Kali will be very short. Uh, prayana alpa ayusa shabhya. Most of the people hmm, will have a very short span of life. Prayana alpa ayusa shabhya kala vashmin juge jana in the age of Kali. In the age of Kali most of the people will have very short span of life. And their nature, their, uh, their characteristics will be their, they will be very lazy. Manda, Sumanda Matayo, Manda Bhagahi Upadruta. They will be lazy, their mentality will be very crooked. Sumanda Matayo, Manda Bhagya. Uh, they will be very unfortunate. They will be devoid of good fortune. Mandabhagya. And Upadruta, they will constantly be troubled by natural calamities. Famine, pestilence, war, 
all kinds of uh, natural calamities, volcanic eruption, earthquake, uh, epidemics. So they could see at that time what would happen in the age of Kali. And today we are seeing what they actually perceived, what they actually forecasted is happening now. So they are concerned uh, that what will happen and then this is the nature, this is the quality, this is the, the, the characteristic of the individuals of this age of Kali and on the other hand the spiritual topic is so vast and unless and until one has a complete understanding, one will not be able to understand what is the purpose. If they take just uh, uh, sections of the Vedic wisdom, they will get completely confused. In this respect, Prabhupada is giving the example of a ladder. The ladder has different rungs. Now if we get stuck with the rung, Will we ever be able to reach the goal? No. So rungs are meant to be used to climb on top of the ladder. So different aspects of the Vedas are like the rungs of the ladder. Now these rungs are not the goal. Even the ladder is not the goal. The goal is to reach the top. Therefore, unless and until one has a complete understanding of the Vedas, one will not understand what is the purpose of the Vedas. So that's why we can see in this age of Kali what has happened. No, not so much importance has been given to the ladder or what to speak of the rungs. Uh, we have already taken to the... Uh, topmost region, the ultimate goal has been revealed to us. Don't worry about this Ram. Karma Kanda section, Gana Kanda section, they're just a ladder. But the goal is actually devotional service. Now in the, when, when you look at the ladder, it may, it may appear, oh, uh, he's on the second rang of the ladder, rung of the ladder, third rung, thirtieth rung, fortieth rung. Oh, he is so elevated. No, that is not the elevation. It's just a means. But the ultimate point is to reach the top. And what is the top? What is the ultimate teachings of the Vedas? Devotional service. So that has been explained and established in the Bhagavad Gita. And uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made it very, very clear. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took us right on the top. Bhagavatam has been properly established by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Bhagavatam has been properly analyzed by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. The actual essence, actual purpose of the Bhagavad Gita has been given by Krishna coming as a devotee. Now Bhagavatam is describing all that. Mm. Sutta Goswami is, is invited, please, please tell us. Uh, and straight away what Sutta Goswami did, uh, he offered his obeisances to his spiritual master. And then his spiritual, then he begins to narrate Srimad Bhagavatam. He started to explain how Parikshit Maharaj was cursed. Before that, he briefly described what happened. Battle of Kurukshetra is over. Bhishma is lying on a bed of arrows. So mercifully, Krishna personally went to him 
and Bhishma instructed Yudhishthir Maharaj uh, about uh, the principle of dharma and then he left his body looking at Krishna, offering prayers to Krishna. Then Krishna made Yudhishthir Maharaj perform three horse sacrifices and established him as a ruler of the earth planet. Uh, already Yudhishthir Maharaj was the sovereign king of the earth. Uh, the enemies have been destroyed along with their allies. So now he is the ruler of the earth planet. But still, spiritually, Krishna wants to establish Yudhishthir Maharaj as the ruler of the earth planet. So he made him perform three horse sacrifices. And uh, then Yudhishthir Maharaj gets the news. After ruling for many, many years, uh, he got the news that Krishna left this planet. So when he got to know that Krishna left the planet, then he considered now what's the point in living? Uh, we came here to participate in Krishna's pastimes. And now that he has left this planet, let's also, let me also leave. And Yudhishthir Maharaj decided to leave, instating Parikshit Maharaj on the throne. He coronated Parikshit Maharaj in the throne of this earth and he left. And when he decided to leave, to give up his body. Uh, that is one way of giving up one's body. In a way, uh, to commit suicide is not advisable. But this way, uh, this kind of giving up one's body is fine. Like one way they do is stop eating and drinking. That is called priopobeshan. Upobeshan means to sit down. Sit down to give up one's body. Sit down and stop eating, stop drinking. And let the soul leave the body. Parikshit Maharaj did that. He sat in priopobeshan. Uh, when he got to know that he is going to leave his body in seven days. But Yudhishthir Maharaj... Uh, did not take that course. He took the course of walking. That is called Mahaprasthan. That is another way of living one's body. And the way to do it is walk and walk and walk without eating, without sleeping, without drinking. And then the body just falls. So he left it. Hastinapur, his kingdom, uh, in this Mahaprasthan. But then his brothers also wanted to follow with him. Bhim, Arjun, Nakul, Sahadev. And Draupadi also accompanied them. The first one to fall was Draupadi. Then Sahadev then Nakul, then Arjun, then Bhim. Bhim actually fell near Badarik Ashram, high up, high up in the Himalayas. Just imagine they started to walk from Delhi, Hastinapur. And they walked and walked and walked without eating, without drinking, without stopping. So this is the Vedic culture. They are so resolute in their determination. They decide something and they will just do it. Not, oh, I am feeling thirsty, let me drink some water. Oh, I am feeling sleepy, let me just... Uh, 15 minutes. No. <laughs> just uh, carry on till the body falls. 
So anyway, uh, this is how the Pandavas left home. And Bhima was the last one to fall. Yudhishthir Maharaj didn't fall. He was so pure that he didn't fall. The ch rather, the chariot came from the spiritual world. Mahabharata, of course, describes in a different way. So the chariot came from the heavenly planet. Uh, but actually, heavenly planet is not the destination of Yudhishthir Maharaj. A pure devotee like him is not interested about heavenly planet. But Mahabharata has been written with a different purpose, to motivate less intelligent people. Uh, so less intelligent people won't be able to think beyond heaven. Uh, less intelligent people are not intelligent enough to understand the spiritual reality and the spiritual goal. Mm. That's why it was not given to them. So, <clears throat> this is how uh, the story begins to unfold. Parikshit Maharaj became a king. And Parikshit Maharaj... Mm, was ruling over the world, entire earth planet, including the oceans. Sa Sagara, Sagar means ocean, and Sa means along with. The earth planet along with the oceans. Earth planet including the oceans, he was the ruler of that, entire earth planet. And he was extremely powerful and he was extremely Krishna conscious uh, that is another uh, consideration mm. Sutta Goswami actually mentioned uh, that he even when he was in his mother's womb he got the darshan of Krishna After his birth, uh, he was uh, playing with Krishna's deities. When children play with toys, he was playing with the deities of Krishna. So that is uh, how Krishna conscious he was from his childhood. There is another consideration. His name was Parikshit. <coughs> Because Pariksha means test. So he was always testing, examining. Is this the personality whom I saw when I was in my mother's womb, who came and protected me? So that shows how Krishna conscious he was. All the time he's thinking about Krishna. Even though he's questioning, is this the personality? Is this the personality? Uh, so because he was constantly doing the examination, Pariksha, uh, his name is Parikshit. So in this way, uh, in, in absolute Krishna consciousness, Parikshit Maharaj was ruling his kingdom. And he was so just and fair that sometimes he would go and see the condition of the country. So he went out to inspect the situation of his country. And he came across a person who was torturing a cow. And he was beating a bull. And the condition of the bull was the bull was standing on one leg. And he was trying to break the other leg of that bull. Now, according to the Vedic culture, or rather according to the proper human culture, uh, rather the human culture is the culture of cow protection. The whole culture is based on cow. And we can see that one gets everything from the cows. Not only we get the milk from the cows, The cow dung 
is the best fertilizer best manure so uh, food is the most important ingredient for our sustenance so uh, from cows we are getting the best milk best food milk and from the cows we are getting the ingredients for fertile for uh, making the land fertile cow dung cow's urine so and then the bulls are there for doing all the heavy work the bulls are cultivating the land plowing the land uh, is taking place with the bulls carrying uh, things from one place to another bulls uh, transportation bulls so if there are cows and if there are bulls then we don't have to worry about anything we'll get everything uh, everything will be available now on the other hand if the cows are tortured then what will happen if the cows are killed then the human civilization is in a very very precarious condition in the when you look at it from that perspective from that light then we can see how dangerous the situation of the world is today uh, instead of depending upon the cows Uh, we are killing the cows instead of depending upon the cows we are depending upon machines we are depending upon all kinds of artificial arrangements uh, and in a moment uh, the whole civilization can be eliminated can be destroyed actually we are standing on a situation like that uh, so many uh, unreliable factors that we are depending on like artificial power to run the machines we need artificial power electricity oil uh, and so forth and we have created the weapons of mass destruction in one hand we are killing the cows but we don't realize that by doing that we are creating a situation that is going to kill us completely wipe us out uh, two bombs two nuclear weapons atom bombs dropped in two dropped in there was first two bombs were dropped in two cities Hiroshima and Nagasaki and two cities were destroyed completely just two bombs destroyed the two entire cities but uh, with time the bombs have been developed in such a way that if we look at them those two bombs they will look like two toys so two toy bombs destroyed the two cities so the bombs that we have today uh, we don't know what kind of destruction it can cause and not only those days two bombs were dropped uh, but the amount of bombs actually i got the statistics maybe about 25 years ago that we have enough bombs to destroy the planet 300 times at that time only we created bombs that would wipe out this planet 300 times so just imagine in what kind of condition we are, we are existing and we are seeing what kind of crazy people are uh, becoming so powerful 
so many terrorists and it's only matter of time some crazy terrorist or some crazy leader even uh, just presses the button and that's it it's just a matter of pressing one button uh, one button will release so many bombs and from the other side so many other bombs will uh, try to retaliate and the worst kind of scenario is <laughs> we are standing in a country india uh, which had been divided on the basis of religion which are in total disagreement in total conflict hindus and muslims uh, hindus are not aggressive but the muslims they are extremely aggressive the whole religion is based on violence and the country was divided on the basis of that so we got a neighbor who is our worst enemy and they have nuclear weapons anyway like this is the situation now at a time like this what can be done uh, that is why the sages actually invited suta goswami to speak so bhagavatam is the answer we are in a condition we are in a situation which is extremely precarious but the answer is shrimad bhagavatam the solution is shrimad bhagavatam So Parikshit Maharaj saw that condition, like there is a person who is torturing the cow and the bull, and as a just king, he immediately unsheathed his sword, about to kill him right there. That person looked like a sudra, but he was dressed like a king. so this is also another uh, criteria for the age of kali the sudras means uh, the totally useless individuals individuals without any knowledge is a sudra now he is dressed like a king that means uh, this kind of people the sudras will become the leader of the country leader of the human society and when these kind of people become leaders what they will do they will create a total damage to the human society they will torture the cows and they will try to break the only leg on which the bull who is representing dharma is standing just only one leg three legs are already bo- broken of dharma Uh, austerity leg is broken mercy leg is broken cleanliness leg is broken the bull is standing on one leg truthfulness and that is also is trying to break and the the cow the mother earth is being tortured brutally so as a just king he wanted to get rid of this unwanted element but then the personality that uh, he begged for his life fell at his feet so this is also another characteristic of a kshatriya warrior when somebody begs forgiveness he forgives okay but generally when somebody begs forgiveness he is truthful he literally means it but that's not in the age of kali one will beg for forgiveness and then the next moment he is going to jump on your throat and that's what happened parikshit maharaj forgave him gave him his life okay fine i won't kill you but you can't stay in my kingdom a person like you cannot stay in my kingdom 
But he beg he looked around and said, The entire earth planet is your kingdom. So if you banish me, where shall I go? Then Parikshit Maharaj said, Okay, uh, you can stay in four these four places where meat eating is going to go on, where there'll be intoxication, intake, and where there'll be prostitution, and the where there'll be gambling. So these are the four places you can stay. Again, Kali looked around and said, These activities don't go on in your entire kingdom. Where shall I go? He said, okay, where there is undesirable accumulation of gold, you can go there. So Kali now found a place, gold. Uh, not just gold, uh, there is a significant connotation behind it. The gold that is not being used in Krishna's service. Gold that is used in Krishna's service, uh, that is perfect. But if the gold is accumulated uh, for any other purpose than Krishna's service, that gold is the place for Kali. So Kali now has got a place. But as I was saying, uh, Kali got a place to stay, but uh, his now his meditation is how to get this king. How to get rid of this king? Because this is my age. This is the age of Kali. So who is the controller or the ruler of this age? Kali. A personality. He's a personality. Again, it's not a fictitious character. He's a person. He has a father and mother. Who are his father and mother? Uh, the personality of envy and the personality of anger. They are also personalities, envy and anger. Uh, and uh, Kali is their son and he is the ruler of this age. His face is very, very vicious, Karala, very vicious and cruel. And he is very fond of quarrel. Karala vadana kruha kalishcha kalaha priya. He is very fond of quarrel. And that is how he spreads his influence. Creating quarrel, creating dissension. So, <clears throat> uh, Kali now is contemplating how to get rid of this king because as long as he is here, I can't establish myself. Kali knew that he won't be able to do anything to him. He is not strong enough. Therefore, he looked for a personality who is stronger than him. Who is that personality? A Brahmana boy. And uh, although uh, he is a little boy, but he is actually being a Brahmana, he is superior to a Kshatriya. Although he is the king of the entire earth planet, but this little boy, due to his Bra being a Brahmana, was more powerful than him. And Kali made him curse Parikshit Maharaj. The curse was, within seven days, Parikshit Maharaj will die. So actually this is how uh, the destruction started in the age of Kali. Started from the top. The head became corrupt. The Brahmana culture became corrupt. Instead of supporting the ruler, the king, now they became inimical to the king. Get rid of this just king. Kshatriyas are in a mode of passion. Sometimes they have hot temper. 
due to their hot temper, due to their anger, sometimes they act in a certain way. <clears throat> a brahmana should understand that and tolerate it. Okay, he did it. He's a warrior. He's a kshatriya. Let him do it. But a brahmana is forgiving and a brahmana is tolerant. But here we are seeing those qualities of a brahmana is lost. And this brahmana boy being motivated by Kali, cursed. And now Parikshit Maharaj is going to go. And the decline actually started when Parikshit Maharaj left. But at the same time, one good thing happened. Parikshit Maharaj also saw that. In one hand, Kali Yuga is one of the most degraded ages. But Kali Yuga has one great advantage. Kalir Doshe Nidhe Rajan Astihi Eko Mahan Guna Kirtana Deva Krishnasya Mukta Sangha Parang Brojet. The age of Kali has one great advantage. That is just by chanting the holy name of the Lord, one can achieve his spiritual perfection. Ostihi eko mahan guna. There is a great advantage in this age. Kirtana deva Krishnasya. Just by chanting the holy name of Krishna, mukta sangha parang brojet. One can become free from his material bondage and go back to the spiritual sky. So in one hand, it is a dangerous age. It's the most degraded age. It's the most fallen of all ages uh, but it has one advantage it has been described uh, by Srila Prabhupada that that's because of that qualification uh, of this age that Parikshit Maharaj spared Kali he didn't kill him so in one hand the Kali Yuga is most degraded as an ocean of sinful activities. Dharma is practically ruined. But there is one great advantage. Just by chanting the holy name, one can very easily achieve his spiritual success. Uh, so as I mentioned, that uh, the ladder and the top, rooftop. Uh, so uh, the ladder is there to climb on top. But in this age we are just by taking shelter of Krishna's holy name we automatically become situated on the top floor. No need for the ladder. We have already surpassed uh, the, the domain of the ladder. We don't have to climb anymore. We are already situated there. That's why Prabhupada said that when one takes to devotional service, it has to be understood that he has achieved the, all the perfections of jag, yagya, tapasya, meditation and so forth. He has already been, trans, been sar, or he already been situated well above those regions. So, <clears throat> so this is the advantage that Parikshit Maharaj could foresee. And uh, this has been, although now he is about to die, uh, but his death again is bringing, Kali's curse is bringing one good fortune, great benediction. The benediction is, Srimad Bhagavatam is spoken. Bhagavatam became manifest. At this point, it goes to another direction also. Vasudev, who is the literary incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he has taken up the responsibility, seeing the condition of the age of Kali, or seeing the condition of the people in the age of Kali, he took it upon himself to simplify the Vedic wisdom. To simplify the Vedic wisdom, the first thing he considered is now it has to be presented in written form. Prior to that, there was no writing, no system of writing. 
The letters were there, but the system of writing was not there. Because there was no need. Because the memory was so sharp that people would just hear from the teacher and they would memorize it. That is how sharp the memory was of the people of that time. But due to the age of Kali, uh, people lost that ability. Basdev could foresee that and that's why he uh, decided to put it in writing. So he did an elaborate job. Uh, he divided the Vedas into four. Then he wrote Itihash, Puran, uh, Upanishads, uh, Samhitas, all that we, branches of knowledge, he presented it in the written form. And then finally he wrote uh, Mahabharat for the less intelligent people. And then he gave Vedanta Sutra, the essence of all the Vedas. So in a way he did the job, like he's completely... Uh, covered everything, given, give, even given Vedanta Sutra, uh, the essence of the Vedas. Vedanta, Anta, end of the Vedic wisdom. But still he was dissatisfied. Still he was dissatisfied. Therefore, he just, he was sitting on the bank of the river Saraswati in Badari Kashram. And he began to wonder what to do now. I have done everything, but still I don't feel satisfied that the job has been properly accomplished. So at that time Narad Muni comes there and Narad Muni tells him, Vas, you have done so many things. Uh, you have divided the Vedas, you have given the Vedantas, Vedangas. You have given the Vedanta uh, Sutra. But in all that, even in Vedanta, even in all your descriptions, you have not properly established the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, generally people, you have what you have done, you have showed people the path of material enjoyment. Dharma, Artha, Kam, Moksha. Uh, this Chatur Varga you have given. You have shown the path of Dharma, how to act uh, according to the Vedic principles. And by doing that, uh, you will get Artha, you will get the wealth and when we have that wealth, a subtle wealth called punna, <coughs> you will be able to, one will be able to enjoy calm. One will be able to fulfill his desires. And then after fulfilling all his desires for so long, when he realizes the futility of that, one will desire for liberation. You have gone up to that much, liberation. Uh, but that liberation that you have this prescribed is merging in the bodily effulgence of the Lord, Brahma Jyoti. You may, not mean, you may not have meant it, but that's how people will understand it. Because there is no direct and clear glorification of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Material enjoyment, uh, only children will go after. Children means people with less intelligent go after material enjoyment. Little more intelligent people will aspire for liberation, but is liberation the goal of life? Mm. Like for example, a prisoner may think Getting out of the prison is the goal of life. But will the prisoner, when he goes out of this prison house, 
will his life be perfect and complete? Uh, I mean, you all are outside the prison, but you think you, all, you have achieved the goal of your life? Uh, then what is the goal of life? Just get out of the prison? Liberation? No. Proper engagement is the goal of life. And that proper engagement is to be engaged in the service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So when Vasudev was instructed by Narad Muni, he understood. And he meditated upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And that is how he actually wrote the Srimad Bhagavatam. So this is how Bhagavatam is the ultimate spiritual wisdom given by Srila Vasudev. And Prabhupada pointed out, what is this Bhagavatam? Vasudev gave the Vedanta Sutra. And Bhagavatam is the commentary on Vedanta Sutra. The explanation of Vedanta Sutra. And this Vedanta Sutra uh, explanation, Srimad Bhagavatam, is non-different from the personality of Godhead himself. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is Srimad Bhagavatam. Is the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Is the total representation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The first two legs, first two cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam are the legs of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Then third and fourth cantos are the thighs of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Fifth canto is the abdomen of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sixth canto is the chest of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Seventh and eighth cantos are his two arms. Ninth canto is his neck. Tenth canto is his smiling lotus face. And the eleventh canto is his forehead and twelfth canto is his head. So in this way, Srimad Bhagavatam is the embodiment of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So in this way, uh, Vasudev presented the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the literary form. He is the literary incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and he manifested the Supreme Personality of Godhead in this most wonderful way. So this is how Bhagavatam appeared. Uh, then briefly I can also tell you, Narad Muni at that time while instructing Srimad Bhagavatam, I mean instructing Vasudev, Narad Muni told him that he was actually a, a son of a maidservant. Uh, he was a son of a maidservant. The son of a maidservant means a sudra. He was born as a sudra. But he received the benediction, the blessings of the uh, great personalities, great sages. Those four great sages were staying at one place during the month of Chaturmas, the four months of monsoon. And uh, so when they were staying there, his mother was serving them. And he, as a child, used to be around and also used to serve them in some way. And then uh, he got some remnants from these personalities. And just by taking the remnants, he developed his spiritual inclination. He their association and they're getting their mercy in the form of their remnants, he actually developed his spiritual inclination. He wanted to uh, 
cultivate spiritual life, which actually meant uh, developing his relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And then, uh, at one point, his mother died out of a snake bite. Now this boy, little boy, uh, he was so much situated in knowledge, he considered that it was a benediction. Uh, he thought that my last uh, her, the obstacle that I had has been removed. Now I am free to move towards my spiritual destination. And just he went to travel north. And there uh, he started to meditate, performing great austerities. Uh, these austerity is not just voluntary austerity. These austerities are a result, an outcome of a spiritual advancement. The more one advances spiritually, more detached one becomes from matter. It is not the other way around, that by performing austerities we can make spiritual development. No. Uh, by performing austerities, one becomes dry. Austerity makes one dry. On the other hand, when one makes spiritual advancement, he naturally becomes, uh, becomes detached from material attachments. Last evening when I was speaking, I gave an example. Like children, uh, they play with toys. To the children, these toys are very important. It's very important. Uh, I mean, that's the, practically, that is the only thing that matters to them. But when a child grows up, what happens? Does he still continue to play with the toys? No, he doesn't even look at the toys. Or even if he does, then he laughs. Oh, <laughs> I don't know why I was so attached to these toys. <laughs> so similarly, when one makes spiritual advancement, one becomes, one loses his interest for material things. Uh, and he automatically becomes detached. Detached from what? Detached from eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. He sees the futility of those activities. Uh, he doesn't give them up, but he spiritualizes them. He eats. He eats Krishna Prashad. He sleeps to get into Yoga Nidra and come closer to Krishna. <laughs> Mating, huh? to the urge to become united with others. Uh, he develops the urge to benefit others, to go out and give Krishna consciousness to them. That is how he develops relationships. And uh, defending, he knows Krishna is going to take care of him, so he doesn't worry about that. So eating Krishna Prashad, sleeping in Yoga Nidra, <laughs> meeting with devotees, <laughs> and depending, defending becomes depending <laughs> upon Krishna. <laughs> so these last two things changes. Mating becomes meeting. <laughs> and uh, depending upon Krishna. So these are the natural transformation of these four animal propensities into proper spiritual propensity. So therefore in Krishna consciousness there is no rejection. Prabhupada said that we reject, we, de we, de we reject only four things. 
these are the things eating sleeping meeting and mating and defending but here we have to also consider the spiritual life is based on brahmachari life sex life is only for procreation not for any other purpose a man and woman should get together through marriage only for the sake of reproduce producing krishna conscious children otherwise one has to be a brahmachari proper said in krishna consciousness even the householders are brahmacharis even the householders are brahmacharis and the main purpose main objective is to develop one's loving relationship with krishna love everybody wants everybody wants to love somebody but we have to understand that the object of love is krishna hare krishna gaur premanande hari hari does anybody have any question if you have question it will be better to give it in writing anyway now i since i did not announce about the writing presenting the questions in writing you can ask yes <clears throat> yeah samhitas are the understandings and the presentation of the understandings of exalted personalities like brahma brahma's presentation right brahma samhita manu samhita uh, like that Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj please accept my humble obeisances okay this is from Vinodini Radhika Dasi uh, please accept my humble obeisances at your lotus feet all glories to Srila Prabhupada all glories to you you stated that as one advances he gradually becomes detached from the four animal propensities one of which is eating My question is what Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has said in Chaitanya Charitamrita Akontho puriya karo you gave the missed out the prasad part of it <laughs> the main part you missed out you wrote Akontho puriya karo shevan but actually Akontho puriya karo prasad shevan acha also or else somewhere else maybe mahaprabhu has said bhalo na khaibe ar bhalo na poribe could you please kindly explain this okay mahaprabhu said bhalo na khaibe do not eat delicious prasha and don't dress in a fancy way she is not saying na khaibe he say bhalo na khaibe <laughs> okay and whatever comes as prasad eat up to your neck akant puriya karo prasad shevan but that is the only one half the other half is shorbokkhon ko bolo hoy naam sankirtan and all the time you chant the holy name of the lord not akantho puriya karo prasad shevan and then go to sleep <laughs> hari krishna uh, looks like some question from uh, the internet 
dear guru maharaj please accept my most humble obeisances at your most merciful lotus feet gurudev we know kali is very strong and will be stronger and stronger knowing this truth how can a person like me fight with him with my low sadhana and with many defects how to encourage myself to fight with him as a sadhaka good question shrimati radhika well uh, as a girl probably you won't understand that but as a boy when you are in school and if some boys trouble him then you know what he naturally does he takes care of a dada <laughs> meaning he takes care of a strong person and when somebody comes to attack him or something he simply takes shelter of him <laughs> and the other guy says rolls up in sleeves and says okay come <laughs> and then huh, they run away from him <laughs> okay so in a similar way uh, the best course of action is to take care of a strong person and feel safe that way now what what to speak of when you have the opportunity to take care to take shelter of the strongest person so who is that strongest person krishna right now tell me kali is strong but krishna is so when you take shelter of krishna kali says <laughs> i'm sorry <laughs> i made a mistake <laughs> i don't want to harm you i didn't come to harm you you become my friend <laughs> <laughs> so the most intelligent thing to do is to take shelter of krishna and become fearless Okay thank you very much any other so another question from the internet <clears throat> So this one is from Nishingananda Das from South Africa Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj thank you very much for that enlightening talk Kali was attacking the planet that was Krishna conscious Does Kali attack us individually or collectively is con and how do we protect ourselves from this Yeah uh, good question Kali will continuously try to defeat us to get us and influence us and subjugate us Therefore we should always remain Krishna conscious uh, and as i mentioned uh, kali can attack anywhere and how does kali attack how many of you remember how kali attacks yes uh, kali attacks through quarrel uh, so whenever there is quarrel you consider that it is kali is coming kali is attacking therefore whenever there is a possibility of quarrel try to avoid that possibility and what is the best way to avoid quarrel by being krishna conscious when you become krishna conscious then you will see that there is no possibility of quarrel uh, so if somebody comes to fight with you you just say hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare So the next question is from Marian from Leicester UK Dandavas Guru Maharaj I have two questions one I read that all devotees are sudras so does that mean that as devotees we have no knowledge mm. well first of all i don't know where you got that concept from uh, so 
I was under the impression that all the devotees are even beyond brahmanas. Uh, and if you say that they are sudras, then you can say that they are transcendental sudras. Uh, because they are servants of Krishna. Mm. So sudra, if the meaning of the sudra is a servant, then yes, devotees are servants of Krishna. In that way, they are transcendental sudras, which is our constitutional position. <clears throat> so this one is from Vinit. Okay. Were there no written forms before Kali Yuga? Uh, no, well, in other Kali Yugas they may, may have been, but generally the writing process, it said, started from Kali Yuga. And especially the Vedic scriptures, Vasudev had given hmm, in a very, very systematic way. Because I heard about Dasarath Maharaj seeing a couple of Brahmanas uh, what is that? Carry, carrying Shastras which was a good sign so he let him let Ram go with Vishamitra. Uh, <clears throat> carrying Shastra well I don't know like uh, that was Treta Yuga because as I mentioned that it is said that Vasudev actually compiled the Vedas, right, written form. Prior to that, they used to carry, yes, they used to carry Shastra. Where? In the memory. Ah, so that is how they used to carry the Shastra. Oh, actually, Marian had another question I forgot. Please could you give some tips on forgiveness. Uh, okay. If somebody slaps you on your right cheek, offer him the left one. <laughs> if somebody comes and <clears throat> begs forgiveness, you tell him, oh no, nothing. You never did anything to me. Uh, so why are you asking for forgiveness? So that is the uh, true nature of a Vaishnava. He never takes any offense. Although offense to him is the most dangerous thing that can happen. <clears throat> Guru Maharaj, there is no name. Hmm. You have mentioned that sleep is the rejuvenation of the soul. Could you kindly explain how something which is eternal, full of knowledge and bliss, needs rejuvenation. Well, whose question is this? Okay. So if you are in full of knowledge and bliss and eternally situated in your spiritual identity, yes, you don't need any rejuvenation. But if you are not, if you are now uh, in uh, in in a in a temporary body consciousness, if you are sad and miserable, <laughs> and if you are devoid of knowledge, then yes, you do need to sleep to rejuvenate the body. The point is, the soul becomes tired by carrying the burden of the body. Uh, therefore, the soul needs to drop the body, become unconscious of this body's burden. And uh, being unconscious of this activity, the soul gets rejuvenated. Is that because the soul is in contact with the body? Yes. Uh, so you are in knowledge. <laughs> Does the soul, when situated in this true spiritual identity, also need rejuvenation? Yeah, as I told you, uh, if the soul is situated in the spiritual platform, 
then it doesn't need the rejuvenation. But still, in Vrindavan they go to sleep. Uh, in spiritual sky, uh, in Vaikuntha they don't need sleep. Uh, but in Vrindavan they go to sleep. They go to sleep to be with Krishna in their dream. Uh, Narendra Krishna Das Okay <clears throat> My humble obeisances Guru Maharaj If Kali is attacking the world how do you explain the quarrel between some communities that is in the Middle East so how do we understand the other countries trying to help stop the conflict. Okay. They are not trying to stop the conflict for Krishna conscious purpose. They are trying to stop the conflict to save their own skin. Because if they don't stop these characters, then day after tomorrow they will attack their country. That's why they are trying to nip it in the bud Although I do not know for how long they will succeed. Okay, any other question? Yes. Uh, what kind of shortcomings? Just chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> See, the benefit of that is Cheto Darpana Marjanam. It's not saying that there is no impurities in the heart. Uh, the these are the impurities uh, lust, greed, anger illusion, pride, envy mm -hmm. these are the impurities of the heart and they are troublesome but by chanting Hare Krishna Mahamantra those impurities will be cleansed the heart will become purified uh, and then when the heart is purified then all these problems will disappear. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, no more questions. I have already five questions and I have only five minutes. No, we have eight minutes. Okay, let's see. Hemanga Chaitanya Das. <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. In Vrindavan, if they could be with Krishna, then why would they want to be with Krishna in their dreams? Good question. But they are not always with Krishna. Right? The cowherd boys are with Krishna during the day. The gopis are with Krishna at the ni during night. They don't get uninterrupted association of Krishna. That's why Govardhan Leela is so special. For seven days, they were with Krishna both day and night. Uh, what they were always desiring. Okay. So when they are not able to be with Krishna, <laughs> okay, Yoga Nidra. <laughs> So next one, Karunika Devi Dasi. <laughs> okay. Uh, Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, you said uh, one becomes dry by doing austerities. Please explain more. Hmm. So, <clears throat> what is austerities? What's the meaning of austerities? Not eating. 
not sleeping, uh, not doing things that we need to do. Right? Now when you do that, did you consider uh, what happens? Does the heart become soft or hard? Uh, yeah, and not only that, along with that, there is a possibility of developing some negative qualities. Becoming proud. Oh, I am so austere. Mm. Etc. Mm. Or I can do this. I am better than you. Mm. Therefore, Krishna consciousness is mm. take it easy. <laughs> right? <laughs> Next question is Vishwarup. Ahmedabad. Maharaj, please. Maharaj, pleasure and pain is for body, but still we suffer. How to understand this? The way to understand is that you are still in your bodily platform. That's why you are being affected by what is happening to your body. The pleasure to the body is pleasing, pain to the body is painful. Because you're identifying yourself with the body. Uh, now, just consider when you are under anesthetics. Hmm, when you are under anesthetics, then even though your body is cut, do you feel it? Why not? Any doctor here? <laughs> Why not? Because your consciousness has been withdrawn from the body. That's why you don't feel uh, either pleasure or pain. Can you imagine somebody having an operation, bypass surgery, <laughs> right? You know what they do in that bypass surgery? They cut open your chest. They, with the device, they open up the thing. They remove open up the chest. Can you imagine? Uh, and then they take out your heart. <laughs> and then they do all kinds of things with your heart. Uh, Mukunda Hari has gone through that experience. <laughs> did you feel anything Mukunda Hari? No. When they did that? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Because you are under anesthetics. Right? Anesthetics means the consciousness was withdrawn from the body. The consciousness, you are not conscious of the body anymore. <clears throat> so now you understand, when the consciousness is in the body, then the body's pleasure, body's pain affects you. When the consciousness is withdrawn from the body, then you don't know what's happening to the body. So as long as your consciousness is in your body, you have the feeling of pleasure and pain, or you be you do become affected by the pleasure and pain of the body. Another question from Nishingananda from South Africa. Guru Maharaj, uh, is Kali a demigod and does he stay in the heavenly planet? What happens to Kali when this age of Kali Yuga ends? Yeah, Kali is a kind of demigod, but not a very pleasant demigod. <laughs> he is in that platform, but as he said, like he's the offspring of a negative personality, uh, anger and envy. And they have a family like that. <laughs> they're superior to the human beings, but their nature is not very divine. Ruchir Tyagi. Okay. <clears throat> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, my question is, do we have original writings of Vasudev today? <laughs> uh, not that I know of, but some writings from Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's time are still there. 5,000 years is a long time. Vasudev writings are not there, not that I know of. Uh, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's writings are there. 
Okay, thank you all very much. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Gaur Premanande Hari Hari Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank <clears throat> you.